Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. It's Mark. With me today on my podcast is one of my oldest friends in the paint industry, Jimmy Gorman. Jimmy is a recently retired 40-year veteran of Benjamin Moore. I met Jimmy when he was the backup sales rep on our territory in the Bronx. The Bronx at the time had three territories. With Benjamin Moore, Jimmy was a young up-and-coming sales rep and he used to back up the sales rep at the time who used to call primarily on my father. This would have been before my days even of working full-time in the business. And and so over those years, Jimmy and I became friends starting in the Bronx. And so at the time that he retired, he was probably my oldest friend in the paint industry going back to my very early days. But there's more to Jimmy's career than just longevity. He has been involved in some absolutely tremendous work done by Benjamin Moore over the decades. One of the reasons why we all as Benjamin Moore dealers had products like Superhide, SuperSpec, and now UltraSpec and the other commercial products in the family available to us was because of work that Jimmy did and a committee of people that he was involved with uh, inside Benjamin Moore that he brought basically the entire commercial uh, line to the company, to dealers probably 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, somewhere around there. Before that work that Jimmy's team had done, Benjamin Moore meant Regal. Uh, They had a couple of inexpensive products beyond that. They had a product called Volpro, uh, which was only available in fives. But generally speaking, they did not have a collection of commercial products. And it was uh, Jimmy's effort that brought those products to the market. And so it's not just that he's he's an absolutely fantastic storyteller. And obviously, there are some time constrictions when you uh, record a conversation. But I hope to let him run and, and tell a couple of his stories. They're absolutely fabulous. So one of my oldest friends I in the industry, I know that many of you listening uh, know Jimmy well. I know that he's been all over the United States for Benjamin Moore and Mont Bell and other parts of the country. And and so I know many of you have met him. I know he's been to all pro shows and many of the all pro dealers who are listening now have met him. And so give Jimmy a listen. Like I said, 40 plus years at Benjamin Moore, a great collection of uh, stories in the paint industry and shoot me a text or an email and let me know uh, what it is that you guys want to hear. And I'll make sure to record that content for you. In the meantime, here's Jimmy. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. It's Mark. With me today on my podcast is my oldest friend in the paint industry, Jim Gorman, uh, recently retired after 40 plus years at Benjamin Moore. Jimmy, how are you today? For the oldest guy you know, I'm Uh, good today, Mark. Thank you. You I didn't say the oldest guy I've known in the paint business. I know older, but I haven't known them for as long. You know, one I used to have a saying, you know, he's a younger guy and One day I said, wait a minute, they're all younger guys. Yeah. (laughs) And so tell me, I'd I'd love to hear some sort of timeline, or I I I know it personally, but I'd I'd love for you to share sort of the timeline of your 42 years with Benjamin Moore. Well, thank you. I am a storyteller, as you know, and the journey's been fantastic. It really started with Pratt and Lambert, fresh out of college in 1977. Uh, covering four boroughs, Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. And that's probably when you would have met my father, Billy, yes. because right. he was a Brad Lambert dealer at the time. Correct. And, and so, so now, just to put a time on this, we got to be talking about 1975 or six, right? So I uh, started in January of 77, so 45 wow. years ago. And uh, you now I was running around, the city was bankrupt, as you know, and it was a mess, yep. and, and it was crazy times, and I had I had about thirty store owners, retailers. Uh, every one of them pretty much carried Ben Moore, so I I learned quickly what it was like to be the second supplier inside yeah. the, the channel. But I also made strong relationships with several retailers that are still in business today. You being one that just sold, but uh, Franklin Lennon still around. Merritt Kaplan Janet, still around. Easter. Still around. I mean, they're all like you and me. They're all they're family friends. You know, I can store whenever I want. It's just a great feeling. And, and Pratt Lambert and Benjamin Moore was a, a common combination in New York City at the time. No question. And, and Pratt and Lambert had the best color system. Yeah. That's the only way I sold paint. And uh, remember an old time painter asked me how old I was. I said 22 and he left and said, kid, if you're going to sell paint, you got to go to Benny Moore. They got this Sandy Flat stuff. It's the only thing I use. 
It was the Alka days. So I, I bide my time, went through some interviews with Ben Moore. Wasn't sure if I wanted to stay in the paint business. But then I decided I liked dealing with the small business owners. You know, I grew up in a small town on Long Island. You know, you had the the liquor store's name on the back of your little league uniform, right. the, dry, the dry cleaner. Yeah. You know, so, <clears throat> yeah, I was, I was very comfortable dealing, working with family owned businesses and uh, worked for one while I was in college. So it fit. So I went to Ben Moore in 1978. So I uh, just was short of 44 years by a month when I retired. And it was pretty funny, Mark. You'll appreciate it. Uh, I got hired on a, and I asked, where's my territory? I had one rule. I wasn't going to move. I had to be in New York. I was obsessed with being a Manhattan type sales person and which was not usual. And, uh, I start on a Monday and on Wednesday, I'm sitting in Montvale, the old building. And I said, can someone please tell me where my territory is? And all the women s- stared at this one guy in charge and, uh, you know, he's in charge of the sales department. And he says, all right, I'll show you. So he gets up and he takes me over to a map of Metro New York and he points to the Bronx and the rooms is silent. You could hear a pin drop. And I just, I'm in my suit and I go, I love the Bronx. (laughs) (laughs) And they're all shocked. They're like, Oh my God. They thought I was. Well, the Bronx was a tough place back in 1978. You didn't fuck around in the Bronx in 1978. Well, no. Well, I was comfortable there because my mother grew up on Washington Parkway in Jerome. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, near, near where my dad grew up. Near yeah. the L. So as a kid, yeah. I, would, I would sit with my grandfather and feed the pigeons. You know, I'd hang out. I'd hang out on the rooftop. So I was very comfortable there. And that really uh, that set me on my path with Ben Moore. And, you know, it's funny if I back it up a minute with Janovic, with Pratt and Lambert, they knew I knew nothing about paint. And the only thing they wanted me to do was put chips in the rack. And I. I found that a little demeaning, you know. The, yeah, that's what the sales reps used to do back right. then. So when I went to the Bronx, I had 22 dealers. Six of them didn't even tin paint. The rest of them could care less about their chip rack. And, and so I didn't have to worry about that side of the business that I didn't like at that age. But, but what I did learn was the maintenance business, the, yeah. the outdoor selling. I had yeah. one, one dealer take me under his wing. The, so I'm going to teach you how to call in hospitals and schools. Then I had another dealer who built a maintenance business in, in Manhattan and with the supers. So I really, you know, realized that I can help these stores make money. And I also realized I was a free sales rep, but to them, but the more I sold, the more they sold and the more I sold. And that, that really set me on the path of being very focused on helping retailers grow their business the way they wanted to grow their business. Some guys don't want to sell hospitals. And I think you set, by the way, a fabulous example when when you were done in the Bronx, that was just about the time that I was coming in full time and you handed off to a collection of really outstanding Benjamin Moore reps. We had uh, Frank Strano, Vinnie Carl, John Powers, George Brenner, all in a row. I don't know that I have them in the same order. And and all of them together, but very much on your model. Come on, Mark, we're going to go out and sell, and yeah. we're going to uh, we're going to grow your business. Well, yeah, and so, sadly, that was driven by the fact that out of my twenty two dealers, I had seven who had no interest in growing their business. And I don't even know why they had the paint line. And so, so I, I had learned- the paint line because in nineteen seventy eight, didn't matter what kind of store you had. 10 people a day walked in and said, you sell Benjamin Moore. Right. Right. And, and Ben Moore's model at the time was to open new accounts, open up new accounts. Time. Right. And I really didn't do much. I only opened one new account in my 15 years. So, so I, I grew my business by growing with my customers. <clears throat> so I really enjoyed that. And then I, when I left the Bronx, I went to Janovic. So I went to learning the outside business to really learn the value of retail store appearance of merchandising. Uh, Neil Janovic was a very good merchandising person. Uh, taught me a lot about that. I learned to, that was a good thing to put the chips in the rack. Uh, and especially when they opened on Sundays, because selfishly, I said, if I fill the racks on Friday, Saturday and Sunday, I'm at the beach, but I'm making money without being there. Uh, and then I, I, I actually brought some knowledge to them on the maintenance business. And we built an outside sales force. And uh, I was very proud of that. The person I I said, Evan, we have to hire a guy. The person we hired stayed there 30 years. And then his son 
succeeded him. They ended up buying, of <laughs> course, the Janovics are out of the business, as you right. know, but they, they ended up buying uh, Tremont, Rich Galdino, your old yep. uh, co-worker at, at Ben Moore, ended up buying Tremont. And, and so once once you got off the road, uh, what were the next steps for you? I, leaving the road is a hard thing for, for salespeople. The hardest thing is moving into a corporate environment. But I was willing to give it a shot. I had some people in Montbell that believed in me, which was nice. And uh, they put me, I was an advertising administrator. So all my friends, my peers in sales made fun of me. I took a, a woman's place, a very dear friend of mine, Lynn Benden, and uh, didn't realize what I was getting into. Basically, the fundamental job was to process co-op. And, and then, the, then the sales rep's job was to sell the co-op advertising. And my job was to put together the agencies and, and the creative and all that. So I learned by creative, by the way, in, in 1980, when Jimmy's talking about, he's talking about a book of, of basically prints right, that right. we could then take to a newspaper and say, you reproduce cut, you this. cut and paste and you put that right. little logo in the yellow page ad. That's right. And so this was nine, 1990 when I went into Montville. And, and so I also realized that I had, I was an advertising major in college. I sold advertising. That was what I wanted to do. And I realized that the Ben Moore sales force couldn't sell advertising. I mean, they just, some of them had a passion for it a lot. Others could care less. I was trying to do some exciting stuff like sponsor the New York Yankees and do things like that. I needed a lot of money to do that stuff. So I convinced Joel Mayer at the time, who was the I remember VP. Joel of the Eastern Division, yep. that, I, that I was going to hold these retailer meetings in the boroughs of New York and Long Island and Jersey. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, I'm going to get a place in Queens at a hotel. I'm going to invite all the reps. What they can do is they'll bring the retailers to a meeting. I give them free food. I stand in front of them and I explain to them why they should invest in this, why it's good as a group to do this. Joel said, I'm out of my mind. He goes, you know, these retailers don't like each other. There's going to be fights. And I said, Joel, I laughed at him. I said, you ever go to a wedding? He goes, yeah. I said, anybody there you don't like? He goes, yeah. I said, you have a fight with him? He goes, no. I said, don't worry about it. Right. And that, that really started me putting retailers together in rooms. I did it up and down the East Coast in Boston, Florida. And that time I was really educating them about the Home Depot threat. Which yeah, was, uh, I remember those meetings right. in New York. You were yeah. a lot fucking younger back then. Right. Wow. <laughs> a lot of black we both, yeah. we both looked so much better back yeah. then. You know, so so that was really fun, but it got me noticed by, you know, Ben Moore's corporate headquarters is not big. The current one's a little spacious, but the old one was small. But it got me noticed by the key and people, and specifically Richard Rube. Yep. Maury Workman was the president. Richmond was president. the chairman of the board, one of the nicest yep. persons I ever met in my life. This was back when the family owned the business. Yes, Richard Rube owned. and Maury Workman were family right. members. And and Ivan was just being groomed to come in. This was the early 90s. Yep. He was a family member as well. Yep. And I remember one day uh, I was filling up. I'd fill his van up with merchandising to take it to the meeting. And Richard's walking in in the afternoon. He goes, what are you doing? So he didn't know what I was doing. So I explained to him, he goes, I don't know. He goes, I didn't know this. So I said, you know, the beauty of it, Richard, he goes, what? I said, when I come back, the van's empty. Right. He said, what do you mean? I go, I sell the stuff right there on the floor. I give it away. It doesn't matter. Right. So, so then I started, Ivan showed up and I started inviting him to the meetings. This is Ivan Dupuy, the CEO of Ben Moore from around 90, 1990. 95. 95. Yeah. He yeah. came in as vice president of marketing. Yep. And then he, he was elevated to president in 95, 96, around there. And Ivan and I became friends. We, we were opposites in every way. And uh, he thought I was a little quirky, which I am. And, yeah, uh, I think that too, yeah. <laughs> but, he, but he didn't try to change me, which was, which was key, because Ben Moore was notorious for trying to mold you as a young person. A gentleman named Floyd Langer did that for me, which was yeah. invaluable to this day. He passed away recently, but whenever I'd see him, I'd thank him for what he did for me because he made me grow up and mature. But uh, Ivan sort of liked my style because it was the opposite of his. And I didn't realize it, but, you know, we'd go to a sales manager's meeting and he'd be my golf partner. He was a great golfer. I'm hacking the ball all over the place. And, and I guess it made him feel good that he won. But we, but we developed a nice friendship. And, uh, and I know he had a lot of confidence in you. I yeah. know that because I knew Ivan. 
well, he, it's funny. He, now he's going to promote me. So I had, I had an opportunity to either be a sales manager, which is what one of my goals was, or to go work in corporate marketing because uh, a gentleman, Charlie Arno, was retiring. So Charlie was a guy who did everything, and I even needed a few other people. One person couldn't fill his shoes. So I asked Joel Mayer, what would I do? And we were sitting in a restaurant, and Joel says to me, look, you moron, the president of the company is asking you to come work for him. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And that, that, that's another statement that changed the journey, if you will, because I was very attracted to the sales manager opportunity. So anyway, so Ivan, I go up to Ivan's office, and uh, – I sit in this couch back in those days had couches and somehow the couches always made you sink down. Right? So you would like a little subversive to the whole, in the whole pecking, right. pecking order thing. And you had to wear your suit upstairs. You had, you know, you had, oh, I remember those days. You yeah. actually escorted upstairs. Yeah. Right? I remember those days. And uh, so anyway, so I'm sitting on the couch and he says, uh, I want you on my team. And I, I accepted the opportunity without knowing the job, just like the Bronx. <laughs> And I said to him, well, what am I doing? So he said, well, you're going to be in charge of merchandising and promotions. So I'm sitting there. I said, I know I really didn't come up to do this. So he's like, what do you mean? I said, I want to be one of these product, product management people I hear them talking about to run product lines. I want to do that. He goes, you're not ready for that. So I said, all right. I said, I'll, I'll go do this, but I'll be back. I told him, don't worry about it. So I, it was a great, great thing he did to me. I learned such a great outside part of the business, the color card manufacturing. I have lifelong friends in that industry today, the merchandising guys, the can label guys, ladies, all those folks. And I really got to go out and I really realized how Ben Moore of corporate was, was adored by the supply chain. I mean, I knew it in the advertising business because they'd all put our logo in their slide deck and say we're Ben Moore's ad agency. But this was a totally different relationship. These, these folks that made the color cards, and there are only three of them in the country. Today, there's two, I think, that make the chips and the color cards. It's, a, it's an art. And, and to, to have Ben Moore's shingle in, in their back pocket to say we're the supplier of Ben Moore's color tools is like saying... I'm the CEO of Mercedes-Benz. So pick, right. pick JP Morgan, pick one, right? Right, right. So, so that was a short stint, though, because my next break came from a new hire, a woman named Ellen Singer, who was a disrupt I remember Ellen. disruptive event in corporate because we had a female now. Yes. In, in charge of And marketing. she was disruptive also in her thinking as well. I, re yes. I remember her. She was a very creative marketer and, she, she, and really brought the company new ideas in terms of how they were seeing their products. No question. She was hired to be disruptive. And I got yeah. the front row seat to, to watch it as the old guard that was slowly retiring. Yep. was looking at this wacky woman that, that would yeah. throw crazy ideas against the wall. Well, well somehow she... she would, we traveled together. She took a liking to me and she, she was in charge of these product management folks. So she said, you know, I'm looking for someone to run the commercial product strategy, which the company never had. And I said, I said, well, I told Ivan, I'd like to do that. He told me I wasn't ready. I, she said, apply for the job. I'll take care of Ivan. And I got the job, but, but that was another huge break. When you think about it, like five people in your career will give you these opportunities and, and so this was, this was one where I was clearly over my head, but she trusted me. And the, back then it was the mid nineties and Ivan was trying to break down all the barriers in the company, all, all the policies that they threw out the policy manual. They, they wanted to be customer centric, they had all these things. And they wanted to, they wanted to be collaborative as an organization and break down silos. So we spent a lot of money and time on team building climbing trees, doing wacky stuff together, but learning to work together. And uh, that was invaluable also because I, to be a, a product, product, product manager in the commercial business, the first thing I had to do was build a product line. Yeah, because at the time, and I even mentioned this as the part of the introduction I made for this episode, I talked about this part of your uh, business because this is the part that I've always been most impressed with. I've enjoyed watching much of your career, but this part of it is really impressive. The truth is that before your, you and your group uh, started working on this project, there was Regal. Well, that was and, it. And, and, and Volpro. 
It right. was Regal and Valpro. If you go, yes, if you go back to the eighties, Regal was the sacred cow. Yeah. Okay. And they were and the top the top dogs in the company get up every day to protect that cow. And the yeah. retailers were the other spoke on that wheel, right? So they would they would come out in the eighties to sell large jobs on a price point. They'd come out with MVP. Then they'd come out, they would discontinue it as soon as his volume hit a certain level. Then they'd come out with Valpro. Then they'd discontinue that. Then they come out with Valpro Plus. Yeah. The only one that they came out with an 89 that stuck was super high. And yeah. the reason it stuck was because of the VOC contents of Sandy Flat basically kicked Sandy Flat off the shelves. The contractors didn't know what to do. The world was upside down with these guys. And we would, us Ben Moore guys got together in the boroughs and said, look, we're going to sell, you know, same story for each of us. Super Hyde is the new alternative to Alcott Flats. And that's how we placed it. That's how we sold it. That's how we got in the contractor's hands. And it became, by 95, Sandy Flat was well gone. Yeah. Uh, except for Calcimine Recoder buried somewhere in the back of stores. And Super Hyde had a, had a decent stronghold, but it couldn't do it by itself. So uh, because of the collaboration things that I was being taught, I, I built teams around the country. I had like five different teams, one in California, one in Chicago, one in Boston, one in New York, and one in Florida. And I filled it with guys that paint people, guys and ladies that un understood the, the commercial business. See, Ben Moore was good with Regal and House Painters, and they got all that. That's right. They also knew that the Ben Moore dealer network, out of 3,000 at the time with 3,500, only 500 really were going to like this business. So I made sure I built it for them, all right, because they would hold the receivables. They would do all yep. the painful stuff. They would do the services. So, so the old Ben Moore was whatever you introduced, everyone had to buy it. So I was causing a little conflict in the building because when the IM line came out, they tell every other rep, you need five IM dealers. I'm like, you're out of your mind. They don't know what they're doing. Right. And you're hurting them. And so it conflicted with my theory that I get up every day to help the dealer grow. So when I came out with super spec was the result of that. I had some, as you know, I had some uh, accounts payable leeway. So it was 90 day terms. Uh, that was a hard sell. I could not have done that without Ivan's approval. The finance guys were against it. Remember, it was the same time of, of our, our history where we were really telling dealers, you got to pay us in 60 days. <laughs> Which was never a thing for, for dealers listening who have just been with Ben Moore for the last 10 or 15 years or so. Let me tell you a little secret from uh, Jimmy in my early days in the business. You never had to pay Ben no, Moore. No. My, my father never paid Ben Moore. I used, to, uh, I used to argue with my father all the time. He would, you remember Murray Harris was our sure. sales rep at the yeah. time. He used to come in every Tuesday to take an order from my father and my father would give him a check for $5,000 every Tuesday. Right. And I would say, dad, aren't we buying more than $5,000 a, a week? And he would say, yeah, we're buying like double that. And <laughs> well, you never seem to catch up, you know, like you yeah. never, you just keep giving, he's like, oh, that, that they'll take it. They'll be fine. <laughs> and that went on for years. When my father yeah. retired, we owed Benjamin Moore $800,000 and <laughs> they had never even called. Right. Yeah, right. So, that was the way it was back then. Right. You know, and a lot of what was going on in the in the late 90s with Ivan and with the commercial product line, and which became the super spec. And I added on eco spec, which was the pristine, which couldn't build traction in the in the residential business. But I knew I could sell the hospitals, healthcare, hospitality. I remember this now that you right. mention it. Yeah. And so, and the, the irony was pristine was the only product that I've ever introduced as a marketing guy. And I told him over lunch one day, I'm, I'm I hope you don't mind. I'm killing your dog and I'm going to move it over to some commercial product line. And he just stared at me. You know, he didn't like when you challenged him sometimes and he, and he just smirked. He said, all right, go ahead and do it. That was in my opinion. And, and you saw the blog I wrote about you uh, last week or two weeks ago. And in my opinion, your work with that group, Jimmy, had as significant of an impact on the dealer channel and on uh, our business as a dealer individually as just about any of the CEOs that you worked for had as far as impact goes. 
Well, thank so you. Good for you for that's accomplishing very, that. Very kind. But without that one CEO, it never would have happened. Yeah, you I know? agree. Well, Ivan, Ivan was uh, the last of a string I've shared with you before. I, I have a lot of confidence in uh, Dan. I worked for him, yeah. as you know, uh, for you know a few months before he fired me unceremoniously, but throw that in there. But I have a lot of confidence in Dan, and I had a lot of confidence in uh, Ivan Dupuy when he was CEO as well. I was very impressed with him. There's about a 30-year period in the middle where I was not particularly impressed. Well, well, you know, it, 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 then Dan was brought up in, in the family business. I think that he had, he started in 89, I believe, in, in the family culture too. And, and, I, and I think he maintained that. I know he did. You know, but you bring up the, the turning point. You know, so it was very interesting. I was at a, a when my brother has a house in Nantucket, I was at his house and he had some of his peers come over from Connecticut, some friends that have homes on Nantucket. And uh, one woman was in finance and she said to me, we never met. She goes, so I hear you just retired. So I said, yeah, from, I worked at Benjamin Moore. She goes, you know, the only pen I ever used and all that happy stuff. Right. But she asked me the, the, the real provocative question. No one's ever asked me. She goes, you were there 40 years. Tell me about the changes. Tell me where it was on day one and where it is today. Well, and, let's do that now, man. That, what was your answer? Well, I smiled at her and I said, that's a good question. I said, the family-owned business was very conservative in everything it did. And I had to wear my blue suit. I couldn't be a green suit. It had to be blue with a white That's shirt. Right. Red, white red shirt, red tie. tie, yeah. Or blue tie. You could swap yeah. out the ties. That was it. Yeah. And clean clean shoes. You know, so your car, if your car wasn't clean when you, your boss was in it, you're in trouble. And they were they were focused on 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 being the dominant retailer to the independent channel. And they were using the regal business and the relationships their sales reps could build to do that. Good strategy, good plan, and open new accounts and expand. You know, really, th at that time, probably 70% of our business was coming out of the Northeast. Yes, and probably so, more than that, actually. Right. It was still a regional industry. Sure yeah, you Williams were a regional had, paint brand. I grew up on Long Island. Sharon Williams had one store in Nassau County, one of the richest yeah. counties on the island. And when I came into the business full-time in the mid mid late 80s uh full time was the very late 80s sherman williams had one store in the five boroughs it was in queens right so right so so the and they had one in the bronx yeah Over no that was in there. yonkers actually right, no they right. did not have one in the bronx when when i first oh, came really? into business there was not a sherman williams in the bronx yeah interesting right so yeah. so four so million they, people no sherman williams right so, so, th so they were regional, they were down in Texas and they were expanding in their States. Florida was, they were big. When I started traveling the Eastern division, I, I, I never, I told them, I don't worry about Sharon Williams in Manhattan. I could care less. Right. But, but with the super spec, I, I focused it on Promar line, focused it on the painters. And I, I realized pretty quickly with that. And then I'll get to the transition that in every large market, Atlanta, Boston, Boston, New York, a little bit different. L.A., Denver, Chicago. There's no more than six large painting contractors, right? And they they, they dominate. So the whole premise behind SuperSpec was to be what I was at Pratt and Lambert, the number two supplier. It was very yeah. simple. I wasn't going to kick Sharon Williams to the curb, and I, I had no intent to. I just knew that being number two supplier is not only important to me; it was important to the contractor to have another option just like a retailer. And it worked. And, and a lot of those, a lot of those gallons that you stole uh, with uh, SuperSpec were actually not even coming from Pratt and Lambert at that point. A lot of them were coming from local grinders that my father and I uh, used to buy paint from, you know, Paragon is gone. General Coatings right. is gone. Uh, Dunham's is gone. These are all companies that, that were headquartered in New York city yeah. that manufactured paint in New York city. And when super hide and super spec became a thing, that's the business that they really took, at least from us. Right. Uh, that's the business that they really took. Right. And the contractors were looking for something other than Conlux. Let's get back to talking about the evolution, the evolution that Benjamin Moore has made over those 44 years. Under the family owned business, Richard Rube succeeded his father, Martin Rube in 1983. Martin had passed away. So, so it was still, he wasn't like, a Belcher family member, but it was a family. Bit. So Richard was one of the classiest people I ever met. He steered, he steered that ship. He kept everything in line. He had Maury, then he had Ivan. He became Ivan's mentor. And, but during the nineties, 
there was a realization that the industry was consolidating and that eventually Ben Worth family ownership couldn't continue. And a lot of what drove that was the internet and the original bulletin board before eBay, where the policy at Ben Moore was that if they offered to sell me stock, any employee, which they did, if I was going to sell it, I had to offer it back to them. Once the bulletin board opened up, Oh yeah, younger, I remember gener- that. younger generations without the connection to the company, but had the stock, were putting it on the internet. And I they, remember that. And shareholder control was being weakened. Yeah. And and Ivan was concerned about this, about the the survivor surviving of the company, and so he brought in as the older Ben Moore guys retired from the board, he brought in some outside folks. And he, part of what everything that we were doing in the product group, myself, the regal guy and the industrial guy, the three of us were really the marketing team, were, were, were tasked with growing each segment to create value in a portfolio in case there was an IPO or anything like that. And that, that, that all tied together with Ivan's vision. That's when the, I, did, I was asked to do the applicators. That's when I realized it. I said, why do we need brushes and rollers? And Ivan said, I have to have diversity in my product offerings. So I, I asked why, and then we talked about it. He was going to sell or go public, which right. was another thing that they were considering at the time right. as well, which would have had the same effect. Right, which was scary to them. And yeah. so, so let's fast forward. So one of the guys on the board of directors, the new board, happened to have a relationship with Warren Buffett. Picks up the phone, calls Warren, says, look, I got this paint company. You might want to meet these guys. Ivan told me the story verbatim. Ivan and Richard flew out to Omaha. I sat with Buffett for four hours. Buffett goes, eh, sounds like a good company. I'll buy it. And so, so now the transition began. And uh, there was early retirements, a lot of things that went on. Uh, at the time, this is when you and I spoke, because I had moved up on. I was doing some of the commercial stuff, but they asked me to oversee the Metro New York market as like the director of sales, which was another great job. It really, it really tore me to give up the commercial one, but it got me back and focused on New York and, and which I really want to do where my roots were, but the, uh, but Buffett also has an arrangement with the, with the CEOs when he buys a company, which is well known that the CEO has to stay on the, uh, for at least five years. So Ivan began his transition uh, to Dennis Abrams. And the way I framed it for the woman in Connecticut who asked me this in Nantucket was, we went from being a conservative policy, family owned business to somewhat of a more financial institution, but with a focus on technology because Dennis had a chemistry background. So we let go of our focus on relationships and certain things like that. We looked at two things, in my opinion, the bottom line, you know, money we had to send to Omaha, and then, which we were able to do. We knew how to do that. But Dennis had a real drive for technology, which was really the plus side to him because it created Gen X coloring. Which and, great for the company, but I have to say not worth the burden that Dennis uh, put on the company, despite my support of that system, I would have to say that without question, his time at the helm of Benjamin Moore is the worst of the 35 that I've been intimately involved with the company for. I don't know if you would agree or not. I don't. I can say they were difficult for me. My career, it was that, that, that fuzzy part of my career where I was, I was an event manager which again, I learned a lot about running events. Cool. All right. And then I went, I went into marketing and that I was almost back into doing co-op stuff. I got involved with a hardware channel. So I was sort of bouncing around, just working on tasks, but they weren't fulfilling at all. I wasn't enjoying it. And Dennis and I were, were opposites that, that he did not appreciate where Ivan and I were opposites that Ivan did appreciate. Yeah. So, so, that, so that's the reality of life on the corporate floor. And I had to learn how to either bail, jump up, jump ship, or stay and, and fight my way through it. It was difficult. No, I, I, yeah, that was a really challenging time for retailers, too. Quick funny story. The very first time I met Dennis, uh, he had called or, you know, his secretary had called and yeah. said, you know, Mr. Abrams, 
uh, would like to meet you. Not that unusual. I had had a relationship uh, with Ivan, my, uh, our standing as a dealer for a hundred years and my writing and stuff. And so I was looking forward to it. I walked into his office and uh, it, it, the meeting did not go well. Uh, we were together for 45 minutes. I only recall him uh, even engaging in the meeting for the first two or three of them. And my sales rep at the time that he became uh, uh, the CEO was John Powers, who I know you remember. Uh, sure. And he called me right after the meeting. He called me right after I got back to the store. What would you think? You know, and I, I told them right there on the spot after one meeting, I thought that Benjamin Moore was fucked and that for as long as that guy was at the uh, in the CEO position, I thought that that company was going to struggle. And it turns out I was the smartest guy in the room because that company struggled in his uh, a decade that he was at the helm. But we, 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 we struggled and the retailers struggled. Yeah. So in the past, the retailers would, would not always see our struggles, nor would we create them. That's right. For, for the retailers. And so there was a, and this is when Super Spec was basically discontinued because there was no interest in helping the retailers with the commercial line. It was, yeah. it was and so then the retailers were forced, you forced their hand to take in a different industrial line, a different commercial line, because it was their business plan, not yours. And right. That, and that's where there was always that strong disconnect. You know, and it's funny, as crazy as it, that period of time was, which was a, a good decade, uh, out of that came my last and best t assignment with, in this journey, which was national accounts, which was something I didn't, I started doing it in the late 90s. I, I tinkered with it like a car, played with the concept, understood the, the value on the customer side. Walgreens was my first national account in 98. It was just a regional gentleman down in Florida, but I, I learned how they operate. I, I, I took everything I learned from Signature Store into understanding wh who at Red Lobster makes the restaurant look good. Who, who, who are you paying over there to make it look good? And that's when, that's when my uh, love of Gen X blossomed. Yeah. Because I had a product that didn't fade on the outside. And, and I had a product that would cover in these deep restaurant colors, two coats, where they're putting four coats of Promar 200 on the wall. My value, once I got the right person, my value was, was, was evident. And the other interesting thing that I learned with national accounts, and A, Dennis supported. He fought me at the beginning. And uh, at that time, his mindset was, we, company stores should be doing everything. And... And they're all gone now. So, so I said, no, you, if you only needed a hundred stores to do what we're trying to do, then Sharon Williams would have a hundred stores. I said, there's a reason you have all these stores, Lo local services and the contractors are spoiled. The, they, especially the guys that work at night. They, they well, go Dennis to had a, just a, unfortunately a, a, a tragic misunderstanding well, of how the channel worked. You know what? He, he didn't, he didn't want to understand how the channel worked. Right. He didn't want to understand what what floated your boat. I'm Dennis. That was obvious, actually, right. from the very first meeting. That was part of the problem. Right, from but, the very first meeting was it was but, obvious he didn't but, give a shit. But what you don't know is when it came to New York, he would confide in me. And, he, you know, he'd say to me, I met so-and-so dealer. I hate them. I'm like, of course you do. <laughs> right. He's, they're right. New Yorkers. He lived in New right. York. I'm certain you got place. that call after he was done with me. I'm 100% certain. I, I would get calls all the time. And and uh, I would somewhat challenge Dennis at times. But it never worked out. And uh, he, was, he was a funny guy. And, and so, so, and he had some other folks on his side that were important in, in, in running the business that, that were involved with the Gen X stuff that really, you know, the, the, the genesis of Gen X was he wanted to make a paint. His, his vision was right. I want to make a paint that's better than Regal. That's what he wanted to do. Yeah. So, so just like I wanted to make a paint that was good for commercial painters, he wanted to make the best thing like barrel and ball or whatever he was looking at at that time. And I was at the meeting and, and the, the lab guys from Flanders came back and said, we can't make it better than Regal. And Dennis said, why not? And he said, because the colorant is the problem, it weakens the product. And he just. That's universal coloring is right. what you were using at the time. And it's too soft. Everyone period. was. And, yeah, and he, everyone. And he, that's right. And he said, I don't give a crap. Go make new coloring. 
And and I you know I, I looked across the room. I'm like that. And I sort of smiled myself. I said, "All right, challenge the guys, make a new yeah. color." Yeah. And they and they they came up with a different way to liquefy it, which was making their own resin. Uh, turned the tinting machine business upside down because they had to make equipment that could be airtight. Yeah. You know, so they had to respond to us if they wanted the business. And you know, so so a lot of, of behind the scenes stuff that. The dealers didn't see it. It was well intended, not well executed. It's not what you do; it's how you do it. And, and so the the limousines and security uh, takes Dennis from the building. Uh, what happens after that? Well, after that, within two days, a gentleman named Bob Merritt shows up. Oh yeah, and, and Bob was one of the founders of the Outback Restaurant business. Yes, I remember that. And uh, the only Ben Moore, the only Ben Moore CEO, by the way, going back to the 1980s that I did not have a relationship with right. was Bob Merritt. He wasn't there long enough. No, to he wasn't generate there long. One. He, you know, he, he again. So it's funny. So so, you know, Ivan leaves, Dennis leaves, new guy shows up. What's he wearing? Blue suit, white shirt, red tie. I'm like, here we go. But the right. world goes around, shoots and ladders. And he was a financial guy, but but he had an, an affection for salespeople. And but he had he had some issues operating on the corporate floor. Sort of let me capsule. If you ever seen Mad Men, there you go. So there were a lot of things that weren't he was around peg in a square hole. He was sort of at the end of his career. That's what I recall is he was brought in uh, in an almost like a nine one one situation right. because Dennis was fired the way he was. But, but he had that Jack Breen way to him from to people who know Jack Breen's history from Sherwin. If if you said the wrong thing to him, he'd just fire you. Yeah, that's what Bob Merritt would do. So everyone got yeah. a little scared. You know, everyone was walking on eggshells a little bit, and uh, but I got along with him fine. But I didn't deal with him too much. But that lasted what two years. Yeah. And, and maybe even less than that. And he right. was fired as well, because if I'm not mistaken, he was inappropriate in the office. Yes. That's what I'm, that's the madman part. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, he was, and, and he, and he decimated the marketing department and let a lot of people go. So a lot of every department lived in some fear. So it was a, it was a bad time. He was not the right person. And then along comes, you know, the, the saint, you know, Mike Searles, Mike Searles, uh, yeah, who was one of the most honest, candid persons I ever met. Yeah, uh, probably to a fault in his career along the way, but but he was he was he was fun. He he knew what his role was. He he adored Warren Buffett. He wasn't going to mess this up. Just tell me what you need me to do, and it really was just write the ship. You know, find the right system. at the time. What needed to happen was a settling down. Right. There was a time, and it's no longer like this now. But there was a time 15 years ago where the relationship between Benjamin Moore and their retailers was desperate. Yes, right. It was in really, really bad shape. The company was struggling to keep their retailers happy, and I think that it was Mike that started to turn that around. And that was after you know a, a dozen or so years of of Dennis, who we went through, and and Bob Merritt, who I don't recall much about his talents as a CEO, but he was kind of an asshole and nobody liked him. Right, right. 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 And yeah. And he wasn't there to be liked. And I don't think right. he knew why. I don't think he I don't think he knew why he was there. The phone rang. Right. I don't think he knew why he was there. Right. right. Exactly. And so you know it's always and but Mike knew it was an honor and he would tell yeah. you it was an honor. He goes, you yeah. got a phone call from Omaha. Yeah. And before he got hired in his office at home, he had a picture of Warren Buffett. This was like Joe DiMaggio calling you or I. So he really did an outstanding job. He molded his senior management team. He he really, you know, there was an old TV commercial years ago, you probably remember, where the boss is handing out airline tickets, telling his sales guys to go meet their customers. And and they said, one guy says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to meet the biggest one. And that was Searles. Go sop, go make everything happy, right? Yeah. It's the paint business. Keep your retailers healthy. And that and Buffett subscribed to that immensely, the whole healthy yeah. retail piece. And and uh, so, so Mike did that for five years. He knew it was a five-year tour. And he knew in that, in that five-year period of time, he had to build a management team and find a successor. And him and Dan became very close. And it was obvious to all of us how the transition would go, you know, a year or two before it happened. And we were all happy about that. And I bet. So, so I can tell you that to, to go full circle, 
the Ben Moore I started with, or the Ben Moore I was with in 1994 or five is pretty much back. Dan's focused on the retailers. He's very engaged. He, he's got a, a good management team that keeps the Omaha piece in shape. The product lines are good. The quality is good. You know, with the, with the COVID thing, he, he's handled it well. No one, you know, when COVID happened, I have a young daughter like you do. And she was, she was only 16 at the time. And she said, what's going to happen? I said, you're going to see a lot of smart things. You're going to see a lot of stupid things because yeah. no one knows no one's been on the skateboard. So they don't know. And so I think that looking back, Dan did a, did a good job. And uh, you would have to say, uh, despite the fact that I hate to throw out platitudes for a dude who, dude who fired me, uh, you'd have to say from my experience that he did an excellent job during the supply chain uh, and raw material shortages of the last two years. I, I do know that Benjamin Moore retailers have struggled and, and, right. I, and I appreciate and respect that they have. But the truth is, I also cover the rest of the industry and everybody else did worse. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I fully agree with you. You know, there were times you'd be out of certain things like advanced. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. But, but well, they're still struggling to but, keep Scuffex on the shelf. Right. But nonetheless, they have, for the most part, they have the products. Dealers have the products they need. And it's just been uh, the last, you know, probably quarter, just been the last three months that Sharon Williams and PPG are starting to report that, okay, our shelves are full. Right. Part of that, my opinion, is that. Dan only had to go to bed every night and get up every morning worrying about supplying one customer. All right. The other guys, Sherwin specifically, had so many other customers. And I know from, from the procurement world that you sign contracts when you sell the Home Depots. And, and the Home airplane Depots. materials, too. Right. That really, Mili- that really the military them, is big. Yeah, that really put them behind. They were not able to fill uh, batches of paint for their stores because they had contracts to make paint for Boeing and other things. And uh, they had no choice what to do with the resins that they were getting, with the pigments they were getting, because right. they had contractual obligations. Right, with, with large penalties for bad. That's right, because of their manufacture, their their cycle, and what they're trying to do. So basically, you know, Sherwin specifically had to say, "Well, we don't, someone's not getting fed today," and it was the, their own stores because the only penalty was. They, they lost sales, they lose some customers. Yeah. And their arrogance will be, we'll get them back. Don't worry. It's up to the, it's uh, Dan's well aware of this. And it's up to Dan and, and the well, team. Dan's well aware because I've been writing about this for six <laughs> months. Don't go telling anybody that Dan figured this out on his own. Dan, Dan, yeah, knows Dan, this Dan because told, he reads my Dan, fucking I told, I told Lip, Dan told me, I told Lipton, this is the way it's going down. Right. <laughs> But, but, I'm uh, taking credit for everything. But but you know I'm I'm proud of that the way he's handled that and and he yeah. handles it internally with his employees with class. Yeah. And uh, so so Dan's a great leader. So that that basically sums up how many CEOs in my life. One, two, got to be six, four, right? Six, six, six. Yeah. That's a lot in forty years. Yeah. yeah. You, yeah. you look at Sherwin; they've had three. Yeah. Though Chris Connor was, you know. It's, when I when I look at Sherwin, Jack was busy building a whole business with Promar 200. We were building right. it. With, he's building it with Promar 200, and building these stores that weren't attractive. You know, then Chris Connors comes in, who was a, a lifelong employee, started in the stock room, and decides to put Sherwin in the retail paint business and make Wall Street happy. You know, he didn't have to worry about the Promar 200. Frankly, he doesn't. Right. Right. <laughs> right. He didn't. And now the new gentleman, I don't know much about it all. So. John Maricus also yeah. started in the corporate training program. They like to uh, bring up their own. And here's why. Look at the success Benjamin Moore is having now with Dan at the helm. Uh, one of the reasons why they have that success uh, is that uh, that more holistic understanding of the company and what its capabilities yep. are that a CEO who started at the bottom uh, has. And so I, I give Ben Moore a lot of credit. I actually would encourage Dan uh, to sort of, if possible, leave the company when he moves on, leave the company in the hands of somebody who's doesn't necessarily have to start at the bottom, but you can't come in like Bob Merritt and just say, I'm here and, and be a champion of Benjamin Moore. You need a time in the company. Right. Yeah, it, exactly. And it, and it's, you know, the difference is, you know, when, when the beginning of my career was a true sales organization, true sales organization, then it moved, it moved away from being a sales organization. Now Dan's moving it back to being a sales organization. Yeah. So 
the, the good news is we've got great news is I tell my friends and family, non, non-industry people, you know, when people ask me about my career, the other thing I said to that woman, I said, I said, I've done something nobody else in this room has done. I've gotten to work with families for 45 years and I've got to see their cultures. And I've got to see the generations pass through. I said, I've got friends. I said, you don't have that in corporate life. Yeah. And, and that's why a guy like me can retire and not miss it because what am I missing? I, I have all these relationships and friendships. Yeah. And, and you're and still I, connected. You and I just had lunch last week. Yeah. Yeah. I walked into a local hardware store the other day to pick something up. And, and the guy says, don't I know you? I go, yeah. <laughs> you know. yeah. Yeah. And, and and it's just a good feeling when you leave, you know, they, they, you chat a bit, you know, you BS a little bit and, and, but it's, it, that's the Get price. a discount on a can of Regal. What more could you want? Uh, I, I was a big customer. I bought $6 worth of keys, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but well, yeah, I do, I do get a discount on pay. <laughs> Jimmy, I have to say that your career is an impressive resume of what can be accomplished in the paint business and, and what you accomplished at Benjamin Moore. Uh, the reason I asked you on is really just so I got a chance to say this in front of anybody who would listen. Uh, really impressed with what you accomplished for Benjamin Moore. And I know you intimately. I'm really impressed with what you accomplished in the name of independent paint retailers. I, I know that that drove a lot of your thinking. And so thank you on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Thank you for the time. And thanks for listening. I mean, it's been a fantastic journey. And anybody that's listening out there, it's a bit more retailer. Thank you for listening.